So, um, you uh, have seen these two sessions uh, working uh, or explaining about, uh, you know, what it happens on the governance uh, and uh, how it happens. So you can uh, actually, um, uh, you actually got uh, too much of deep dive information about uh, uh, WSO2 governance registry, uh, what exactly it can do and, uh, you know, how it can do, okay? Uh, so uh, for an enterprise um, architect community or any solution architects or uh, um, or, uh, uh, you know, architect community uh, within your organi organization, um, uh, you will end up in answering questions like, you know, why you should do that? And that's what we are going to look into, uh, uh, you know, deep dive in this session. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, it is uh, uh, governance, and uh, we have... Uh, in the industry currently, um, uh, you know, we talk about integration space within services and APIs, uh, and uh, the topic goes to take you to, um, you know, how you should look um, at the service governance, how you should good look at uh, the API governance, and uh, how, uh, what do you need to do with the current existing service governance? Uh, um, you know, is API governance is going to replace the service governance and things like that? Uh, we will talk about that in this session. So, um, uh, agenda itself uh, is uh, very much exhaustive. Uh, so I, I, I won't deep dive into the customer uh, use cases because um, though it was a case study and I think most of uh, the customer ask uh, uh, has been already discussed along with uh, how the tool can enable you to achieve what you want to do uh, in terms of governance and that's also is covered. So I would uh, focus in terms of, you know, what is this um, governance is all about, and why should we uh, do that, uh, and um, uh, you know what are the trends, and what should be the roadmap, what you should look at. Since governance is one topic which comes, um, you know, it is very important, but it is not that urgent, that kind of a quadrant uh, where uh, typical IT implementations go. Uh, but however, I have a um, uh, you know different look at it uh, because. Um, uh, if you do start the governance uh, right from the beginning, um, perhaps you will not, um, you know, end up in a situation where you need to rescue from uh, some uh, dangerous, uh, uh, you know, situations in production time. You know, that's the key message I want to pass in here, uh, where um, uh, we will agree in the beginning to understand what's a service, what's an API, what's governance, and why you should have governance. Uh, what is the role of your governance registry uh, and what is the impact of API governance and what are the trends and what are the roadmaps. That's what we will look at. Uh, the, uh, the, so uh, just to uh, take the story on, right, so um, I recently consulted one of the customers where uh, he wanted to um, have one single location uh, to store all his assets. That was very important for him because he was a customer who was having almost like 500 plus services. And also, to, uh, you know, last over the one year, and they have developed around 100 plus uh, APIs. Um, if you ask him at any given point of time, he, uh, his organization has multiple uh, LOBs. And uh, if I ask him, okay, give me uh, an API that covers a customer and his address and his payment terms and his um, uh, you know, uh, uh, profile and things like that, uh, he would look at, okay, you go to that particular uh, LOB, ask him for a customer, and then uh, go to the compliance department about his uh, payment terms and go to the loans department to understand his uh, payment history and things like that. And there was no central location, and that was his problem, where he couldn't uh, really uh, get into one single view uh, of uh, the services and the APIs involved. And that is his first task. And uh, he wanted to keep the documentation up to date because 
uh, the consumers who want to, uh, the success of a service or an API comes from a fact that how best it is easily uh, accessible, how good it is in terms of, uh, you know, consumption and things like that. So he wanted to have all the documentation updated so that consumers can easily start consuming it. And uh, he wanted to know the status of a service or an API lifecycle at any given point of time. Uh, he would say, yeah, I have asked one particular service or an API to be uh, in production this time. And, you know, currently, what is the status of, of it? Is it uh, developed, tested, uh, deployed onto QA or, you know, user accepted or it is going into the production uh, at any given point of time? In the scenario of if it is one or two services or at least the tens and bunches of it, he could definitely get a uh, figure of it. But uh, when it grows exponentially in terms of 500 plus and 1,000 plus, uh, you know, assets there, uh, obviously it is uh, not possible uh, to have a, a full process me mechanism to uh, get a quick view of that. So uh, he wanted to have uh, a mechanism to store, uh, see uh, any particular status uh, of a service at any given point of time. That's one of his requirements. The other one is um, in an integration space, as I was saying, like, you know, he wanted to visualize and uh, he wanted to see the dependency. Suppose if he touches one service, you never know where all it is going to blow up, right? So uh, the, it, this is the practical problem. Uh, uh, you are one single API would have been underlying multiple services or a, an API it, it itself can have multiple APIs within it. So. Uh, uh, you know, it looks all hunky-dory in terms of tens of services, but when it goes to 500,000 services, it is going to be a real nightmare, okay? Uh, having implemented uh, multiple services and a single service at the maximum versions of about uh, eight versions, uh, practically eight versions, uh, because there were three different organizations getting merged, and then you wanted to bring in the capabilities one by one into a broader, bigger, uh, uh, service uh, uh, with eight versions. That is what was uh, looked at and I personally have that experience where you will really see the nightmare uh, to, uh, to have one um, uh, place where you can really visualize easily that if you touch that API, it is going to blow up these many APIs or services. It's, you know, visually representation of that would really help um, uh, you know, to take decisions to make modifications quickly. Uh, uh, and reusability of, uh, uh, you know, the services. What is the index? How do you measure? Uh, how many services you, are, you can potentially reuse? The, you know, tool may not answer it today, but definitely it might answer tomorrow. Uh, but that's one of the asks, uh, which can be an input to uh, uh, product developers too. Uh, that is one. So uh, let's agree, quickly uh, get into the contents. Uh, uh, I have less time. So uh, a service, uh, you know, I'm not referring to any Gartner. I'm not referring to Forrester. Uh, I'm referring to my experience. You know? It's just, um, you know, business functionality that you have implemented and in a piece of code, it could be, it could be any programming language, but uh, if it is accessible over internet, um, uh, that's a service. Uh, and it is qualified by multiple uh, qualifiers. You know, it, it should be dis discoverable. Uh, it should be uh, having a contract, and it, you know, uh, it should adhere to some standards. All of those things are there. But uh, in essence, it's a piece of uh, code which is accessible over internet, right? And API. Uh, so the question might come like, you know, API is also something similar, uh, but. Uh, is uh, API not a service? Yes, it is, uh, technically, uh, but uh, how does API differ from a service? Um, is about, you know, it, it acts as an interface um, uh, rather than the actual business logic execution. It wants to take up something different because if you put your service onto the production, uh, other than doing your actual business logic execution, there are many things that you need to take care. For example, uh, if you put your interface outside uh, to, the, uh, to, uh, to be accessible to the internet, 
Uh, so you need to check who is the consumer and uh, is he going to be in hazardous or is he uh, accessing it uh, uh, for a right reason? Um, uh, can he make any uh, regular expression threat or SQL injections or IP protection or whatnot? You know, you can think of all the possible uh, security issues or if you want to make your service uh, easily subscribable uh, to a particular consumption, um, uh, you know, and if you want to make any subscriber uh, to uh, access your API uh, and make it so popular, there are so many other things that you need to take care of, which we will see that. Uh, so these kind of things uh, are, were missing in our um, uh, regular, uh, you know, service implementations that we have done. Um, so, though it was bit and pieces available in multiple different places, but API is one, API management or API governance is one such kind of a thing where you can have all these things, uh, you know, embedded in it. So, other than business logic execution predominantly, uh, the rest other things, non-functionals are taken care in API. Okay, so to put it very simple. And then uh, governance, of course, it's um, a course of action um, and a policies and processes, and also some responsibilities that you give it to a certain set of people in the organization, uh, you know, to uh, apply it at different levels, right? So that's the governance. Um, uh, so how does all of these three coexist? Basically, uh, you know, it, to put it in very simple things, you have your enterprise data set um, or, or, or enterprise applications. Uh, all of that hold uh, the, uh, or act as a system of records which need to be exposed to the outside world. So you take the data and then through services you expose it to the consumer who can be either your end consumer or your partner or your um, uh, you know, third party application developer or um, anyone who can, who, who is capable of consuming your service on the internet. However, uh, your business capability cannot be directly given to the consumer uh, because of the facts which we, which we just discussed. Uh, so you have to have a proxy in between. And that's what the role of API is. So all of them work in um, the uh, scenarios like digital world uh, where you are uh, definitely um, uh, making everything digital. So yesterday uh, in the keynote we have seen Sanjeev was talking about a use case where I haven't seen him talking about any manual process at all, right? Starting from, uh, you know, uh, booking his tickets, still going and coming back and paying the taxes. He never spoke about any, any um, you know, manual processes. That's what, you know, I, I'm not surprised. Uh, you know, in today's world, uh, that is what is expected, and that's what digitalization, digital world is all about. And importantly, interestingly, everything works on APS going forward. That's the point of view there, right? So that is one. And then the, all the services that we have been building in the SUO world, uh, you know, go for service identification, take the re uh, request, identify a service, and then look for the granularity of it, whether you are going to go for a, um, uh, you know, um, a larger service or a smaller service. Of course, there is no definition for large and small, but I'm, uh, you have to take a call uh, at the time of, uh, you know, really implementing your service. Uh, so the, w what should the, gra whether it is a fine-grained or, uh, you know, coarse-grained service, and whether you are talking about a utility service or you are talking about a, um, uh, you know, composition, composite service or you are talking about orchestration service or a proxy service, whatnot. You know, th there are so many, um, uh, um, uh, you know, intricacies that you need to go through while you are designing a service. Nowadays, it's a, it's a, it's a, a trend of uh, uh, developing your microservices. While you have, you know, the microservices, uh, a single service of your traditional SOA service can be split into hundreds of services, hundreds of microservices, or hundreds of uh, traditional services can go into a single microservice. That's, th that is what is the implication. However, uh, by trend, if you see, uh, you know, traditional uh, SOA services can, uh, there are chances of getting uh, SOA services getting split into multiple microservices. It means if you have X number of services in current trend, uh, it might go into X plus delta X number of microservices in real world going forward. So it means basically more moving parts. 
and it means basically more governance that is required, right? And uh, also pervasive APIs, I, we just spoke about it. So uh, too, much of, uh, too much of text there. Um, I, while, while I speak, you know, uh, I leave it to you guys to go through it. But, uh, you know, essentially what it talks about is there is a significance, uh, there is a, a requirement for, uh, you know, uh, services to be governed, right? Uh, if you look at uh, the, the principles um, that you, um, uh, you know, follow while building a service or while bringing a service into the production, there are so many things that you would take, right, into consideration. Something like, so the service should be loosely coupled. I think we have seen the keynote also, why that keynote is all about, uh, 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 talking all about loose coupling, right? Uh, so it is the um, between consumer and provider, why that they should be loosely coupled. And that is what is taken care. And then uh, the autonomous uh, nature of your services is to be embedded uh, in your thought process at the time of designing a particular service. Uh, you know, th these are all the practical problems. When you are seeing, okay, if you have designed for a pressure of a, a business, uh, a service as an architect, um, uh, to an extent that all your fields are, uh, you know, uh, brought into a service and exposed it to the consumer, today your problem is solved. But it is not there. Tomorrow, you are going to definitely end up in refactoring that service to an extent that a service is not meant to be consumed by only one guy in real-time production, right? It is supposed to take care of uh, multiple consumers for your services, uh, whether he is a partner, whether he is a trusted consumer, whether he is a third-party application developer, or whoever it is, right? You need to think what makes sense for your service to be, um, uh, you know, in versioned. So you have to goal, uh, keep a goal, uh, as many number of less versions as possible you should be able to, um, uh, you know, get into the production. That's the idea. So um, there are many drivers. Um, a lack of uh, clarity on the service ownership. Because um, uh, when you really uh, uh, go into the real-time production, there will be multiple lines of businesses. The same um, uh, service will definitely be uh, you know, designed and developed and owned uh, by multiple LOBs. It happens in practicality. Um, uh, I was just working for an energy company. Uh, they have uh, refineries, they have, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, they have multiple departments where they, they have something called as functions, they have, um, uh, you know, upstream, they have downstream, and different um, uh, departments. All of them were working in a fashion as if they are running their individual lines of businesses. They, they do not have anything to do with uh, any other departments it w because they were sponsoring and they are responsible for PNL and they would go for okay this is my service I need this service to go uh, to production next month according to my business requirement and the same service is supposed to be going into production in next month because there is already production in place for other department you as an architect need to take a best call how do you convince? It's not about, you know, technically building a service. It's about uh, bringing in reusability, bring, bringing in uh, uh, the maintainability. Tomorrow, you, you can, it is very easy for an SI partner to go and develop a new service and then make the uh, integration platform with bunches of uh, uh, services, but uh, it is up to your call how best you can um, uh, you know, make this lean uh, and then m make it maintainable. That's that's the fact about it. Uh, so there are many things like, you know, no clarity on roles and responsibilities, lack of process to measure the benefits and things like that by introducing the governance, um, be it at a, you know, design time or at runtime, you, you, you will be able to leverage the benefits of, uh, you know, having uh, governance in place. That's one. Uh, so the same 
goes to the uh, API governance also. Um, you know, uh, when you are, when we have understood that APIs are just one more layer, very thin layer on top of the services that you need to keep, uh, obviously you are not giving the value proposition of uh, uh, service reusability. Uh, one quick question. So uh, how many have you have developed SOA services and shown a benefit of reusability more than 5%, 10%? Not really, right? That's, that's the hard truth of this session. So, SOA governance, uh, I mean, SOA services have been in the market uh, just giving a quote that I can make reuse of your services. That's practically not possible. Um, uh, of course, I've seen multiple cu customers, uh, multiple engagements, um, even in the board of CEOs and CTOs, None of them have practically vouched that, you know, my enterprise is gone more than 30% uh, uh, reuse on my services. That's a practical. So, leave that aside, and then we are in the API world, so where you have to really come into, uh, uh, you know, versatility. The concentration is totally different, okay? How best you can engage with the customer, how best you can directly reach your customers on their devices. I cannot imagine a man without a, without a mobile today. So um, uh, all the interfaces and go and directly hit the customer directly. If I want to, I as a petroleum, petroleum company or I as an educationist or I, I as a uh, you know, uh, uh, industry with an insurance or something like that, if I need to offer some offers to the customer to grab my business or to expand my business, the only way that I can reach to the customer is to hit him directly where he has the access to. And that's the essence of API, right? So your services with a, with a SOAP message, you know, you, of course, Nowadays, devices are capable enough to handle a large uh, message sizes, but still, uh, rest kind of things came with, with the API, and then how to onboard him, how to uh, give him keys, how to enable the security, how to give the analytics to him, how to give, uh, you know, how to make uh, your partners to consume your API, uh, as well as give a mechanism to monetize it. So these are the differentiating factors that were coming into the case. So, so the things that are, uh, you know, differentiating your uh, services governance with the API governance is this, where API concentrates on the community uh, building and uh, API also concentrates on um, reaching to the different stakeholders. It need not be your partners. It, ca it can be a third-party application developer. It can be, uh, you know, internet threat production as an Im importance um, there and uh, um, analytics and monetization. These are the things where your uh, APIs um, um, and and its governance uh, makes difference in in terms of normal SOA, uh, traditional SOA implementations. So why is it critical? Because you have heterogeneous uh, stakeholders. You do not have you know earlier in SOA world you knew your consumer. Your, your consumers are very well known and you fight with them. You make sure that, okay, I use MQ and this is my channel, channel name, this is my you know, Q name, this is my topic name, this is what you should have, this is what you should send in the header, this is what I will go, I interpret it and customer ID, uh, you know, all of this were very well agreed and it is tightly coupled. Though we say that it is loosely coupled, the mechanism to build a loosely coupled service is tightly coupled. Right, that's the truth. And uh, so here, um, so the, the things are a little different. Um, so you have different stakeholders. You know, the, the, the interesting thing is, when you expose an API, you don't even know who is your consumer, right? So that is the challenge that you are gonna, uh, uh, you know, uh, face here. So uh, heterogeneous stakeholders are there. Usage sensitivity, you don't know what kind of um, uh, consumers are there, what kind of data that you need to expose, is it good for them, is it bad for them, or it is good for me, bad for me, all that things we need to think. And then, obviously, it is customer experience engineering. So, earlier, when you have a SOA service, 
unless you know the URL, unless you know the input pattern, unless you know the message types, unless you know the transport, unless you know many things, so you were unable to access the servers. But now, it is just an URL. And that too, you don't have to go and ask for anyone. You can just browse. It's all available on uh, the stores or on the app stores, or anything. Just look for it, browse for it, and then start engaging yourself. You can go, sign up. It will be triggering a uh, process inside or behind uh, where it will ask for uh, you know, approval processes, and you will continue to do that. The second thing, uh, the, uh, I, that was about the APIs. The, the second thing is, uh, why service governance is also critical. You know, we, we have been, you know, quickly developing, delivering the services, hundreds, hundreds of them. Um, and over the last decade, you know, I, I, at an industry level, we would have uh, developed tons of services till now. Um, so, but do you think that all of those services would have considered all of this? For example, uh, you know, coupling, uh, right? Loose coupling, abstraction, uh, reusability factor, autonomous. All have we all built only stateless sessions till uh, stateless services till today? But the design preaches it that your service need to be a stateless, right? So uh, technically, it is possible. You have had session beans, entity beans, and message-driven beans. So entity beans were developed, definitely dealing with the entity itself, the data itself. So, um, I mean, when, when we are talking about the design principles for a service, these are the things, but at, at any given point of time, when you are looking from a governance lens, you were supposed to govern all of this, right? And then, what is the impact of having your governance, be it an API, be it service. So culturally, you need to start thinking at, um, uh, you know, uh, design principle. Uh, you need to start looking from top down, uh, from a resource perspective, and then uh, look from a compliance sense. You know, um, uh, the, the one of my experiences, uh, I have had an API management program, uh, which was ready to go to production, but I waited for three full months to go through this IRM process, uh, incident risk management process, um, unless he was not signing off, um, uh, you know, we were all uh, waiting with a whole bunch of team um, uh, to to get a compliance. So uh, I would put that on top because um, uh, compliance is such important for a bus you know serious customer who wants to do business through the APIs. And then customer experience um, about, you know, I should feel comfortable uh, to expose my APIs, you know, because it is governed be be behind. And then ease of access and quick reaction to market trends. Um, uh, in the term of, uh, in, the, in the urgency of, you know, keeping your business expansion in mind, uh, if you start, um, uh, you know, uh, developing any set of APIs and then exposing them to uh, the market left, right, and center, uh, you would end up in uh, different situations. So uh, take care of the governance in the beginning itself. Uh, and then focus, you know, what should be your focus? Is it the reusability or is it the customer experience? Is it the developer adoption? Uh, you know, what uh, the things that you need to have, these kind of things. So culturally and uh, customer experience-wise and Focus-wise, if you implement the governance, it will change your organization. So, how should you do that? You know, these are all the things. You know, you you as a, I, I would talk in a different slide uh, quickly uh, on uh, the roadmap, uh, where um, you know, if your governance is um, um, at a very pre, uh, very uh, niche stage, at least start with defining the governance processes. Uh, define, um, uh, evaluate the governance product, uh, and then in the next level, go for implementing the governance organization. Uh, you know, basically uh, uh, set that okay, this is the governance custodian, and then through him, the, all the processes are going to happen, and then implement uh, some kind of governance tools in the uh, next one. Uh, in the third stage, um, go and optimize where you should go for, uh, you know, taking the fundings for your governance organization, creating the common SLAs and uh, 
implement compliance monitoring and all of these things as an advanced one. So this could be a roadmap for you. Of course, governance registry that you have seen, I think I'm, I'm done with my... <laughs>